Thank you for joining us. And I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us and for being subscribers to The Lever. I uh, always want to say that. We couldn't do this work without you. And we really appreciate um, everyone participating. And Ro, we appreciate you participating. I know it's a little late uh, there on the East Coast. Uh, it's about dinner time here uh, in the least populated time zone, which is where I live. Uh, the time zone that everybody forgets, the mountain time zone. Uh, <laughs> I would like to call it the best time zone, but um, I'm sure you would, you would, uh, others would dispute that. Uh, so There's tonight, so many fights in Washington. I don't, I don't think we need a fight over time zone. Yeah, right. But I'm, right. But, but I'm a fan of the lever. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I know from the beginning of when you started this project, David, and and you've had a couple of stories that have really just gone uh, viral nationally, and it's uh, impressive to see. And now many of my colleagues read it. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, so I guess I want to start. We're going to we're going to talk about your anti-corruption reform plan, which actually uh, took center stage in the um, House speakers race at, at one point. We're going to get into all of that. Uh, I want to remind folks you can um, put questions into the into the chat and the Q&A and we'll try to get to as many of them uh, as possible. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions about a bunch of different things. But before we get to the anti-corruption stuff, I just want to um, let's take a moment to talk about the obviously huge news uh, in, in the world right now, which is the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, I would just open up, ask an open ended question here, which is not just what is your reaction to the conflict. I mean, it's awful. Everything that's been happening is just, it's just awful, but how are you thinking about it? How do you think others should be thinking about it? What are the big questions that we should be asking? What are the things that we're not talking about that we should be talking about and that policymakers, whether the Biden administration or others should be focused on? Well, first we have to start with a clear unequivocal condemnation of Hamas is terrorist attacks. I mean, you, you can't see the pictures of the beheading of babies, the massacre of women and children, uh, the targeting of women and, 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 and children and men at the concert and, and not be sick to your stomach. I mean, that is uh, uncalled for. And we should stand in solidarity uh, with the people of Israel and recognize that Israel has a right to defend itself uh, against the Hamas terrorism and, and the Hamas terror network. We can be for that and also recognize that the conditions in Gaza uh, have been horrendous, that you have 2 million people in a very densely populated area uh, who largely have not been able to leave because of both the blockade from Israel and Egypt, uh, have 40 to 50% unemployment, uh, have a, a case where half of those folks are under the age of 18. Uh, and we need to make sure that there is still humanitarian assistance, aid, food, fuel going in there. I say this as someone who pushed for that in Yemen when uh, there was not uh, aid going into Yemen, when there was not fuel going into Yemen. And I guess we have to, in this country, be able to say you can stand with Israel. You can recognize the horrors of Hamas's attack. You can recognize what Israel needs to do to defend itself against Hamas and still value uh, both Israeli lives and Palestinian lives and want to make sure that uh, any dismantling of Hamas terrorists uh, does not has a, a, a an awareness to minimize Palestinian loss of life. Yeah, I think I think on this debate and, and for folks who who just to let folks know our our podcast tomorrow, which will be in your email box tomorrow, uh, is a very very deep dive on the Israel Palestine uh, conflict with former Bernie Sanders advisors Matt Duss and Danny Bessner. So we're going to go we go deep on that. I do I do no, think they're, yeah they're far more thought this is their expertise. So they're, yes. they're good uh, people. But I want to just I want to just highlight what you said. I, I I think there's this inclination now, and I remember it in the lead up to the Iraq War as well, where it's very with us or against us, on, uh, sort of on both sides, like the, of the debate, right? If you can, there's this 
insinuation that if you condemn Hamas's incredibly unacceptable and awful terrorism, it must mean you not only stand with the Israelis, but can't acknowledge or you're not acknowledging the unacceptable uh, conditions of the Israeli occupation in Gaza. And I think that attempt to uh, divide things uh, and not acknowledge that there are multiple bad things going on at the same time and they can all be true at the same time, I think it's it, it, it makes it impossible uh, to have any kind of honest discussion about this. So I appreciate you making that point that 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 two things in in what you said can be true at the same time. And, and I think that's well, David, really go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, it, I accept the analogy that this is Israel's 9-11 and, and and terrorism. But to me, one of the lessons of 9-11 was that there was solidarity with America. There was complete in that moment uh, a sense that America had the right to defend itself. But we also made mistakes in the war on terrorism, going into Iraq, staying in Afghanistan for 20 years, uh, the the uh, Abu Ghraib uh, uh, torture episodes. And so it is perfectly reasonable to say we should show solidarity with Israel. They have the right to defend themselves. They should bring the perpetrators of these horrific terrorist attacks to, to justice and dismantle uh, terrorist organizations or Hamas leaders who want to attack Israel and at the same time say that uh, we want to make sure humanitarian aid goes into for goes to Palestinian people. There should be a minimal loss of Palestinian life uh, and that there uh, should be uh, some restraint when it comes to Palestinian civilians. It seems to me that's uh, uh, a, a consistent view. Now, maybe after I'll read the comments and find out why that's not the case, but that's it's my view, at least. Look, I, I I totally agree, and I also think it's 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 it can be said that while Hamas's actions are completely unjustified, there is no justification. There's no but. There's no describing what Hamas did, and then but. There's no qualifying justification for that. I think we can also. I think it's also can be true that the ongoing occupation and the conditions in places like Gaza create the conditions for um, uh, despair, which we know breeds the conditions for opportunist organizations like Hamas to commit uh, violence, that, that those things can be true. And we have to be able to at least acknowledge those realities. So I, I really appreciate you, 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 you saying that. Um, okay, so let's, and I should mention again, for those who are just joining us, if you want to ask a question, please type your question to the, into the Q&A chat uh, at the bottom of your screen. Let's talk about um, what's going on uh, in Congress. Um, and um, actually, an easy thing to do, I'm not sure if you have answers, but for those, who, I, I, I have read that there may be an aid package uh, for for Israel. What's the state of play? What have you been hearing from the administration about what or, or what it will want Congress to do in the face of this particular crisis? Well, right now we can't do anything, David. We don't have a speaker. We basically show up <laughs> and uh, wait to, f to sure. find a speaker. Literally, you can't do a floor vote. You can't do uh, a floor speech. It's uh, Congress is at gridlock. Uh, so for all of the Republican uh, rhetoric of how they're standing in solidarity with Israel, they can't even pick a speaker of the House to get anything uh, done. But I expect that the uh, Meeks-McCall bill, which has overwhelming support, almost 400 members of Congress will pass. And basically that says Israel has a right to defend itself. We recognize that. We stand in solidarity with Israel. Uh, the Hamas attacks were brutal. They were lawful. Uh, and it, 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 it will pass overwhelmingly. Uh, b beyond that, uh, then it depends on what uh, the administration uh, requests of Congress. There's a sense of tying potentially any additional support for Israel uh, with Ukraine aid, uh, and it remains to be seen what the administration will do. Let's talk about the speaker's race. That's what we taught. We told people we wanted to, to that was the sort of headline of this. Um, the speaker's race, I think the news today was that um, Republican Congressman Steve Scalise is the, I think is the designee or the or the nominee of the, of the Republicans. Um, what is the state of is is that really the the state of play? I guess I would ask you and talk a little bit about how your anti-corruption plan got a little bit of a spotlight 
kind of, for some people, unexpectedly in the Republican debate over the speaker's race. Well, I had people calling me, I don't want to say who, from the Republican side, the minute Scalise won and everyone was tweeting out that he was going to have the vote saying there's he doesn't have the votes and he's going down. And so I think they still have a lot of work to do on their side. And I personally know a couple members on their side who are nowhere close to uh, to voting for Scalise. And I just don't want to share personal conversations on that. Otherwise, I'd share their, their names, but they're far from uh, coalescing. I had tweeted out and have been pushing a, a political reform plan that to me was common sense. I didn't think it would get more attention. And suddenly I gave this one minute speech on the House floor and it you know, went viral. It's one of the few things I've done that went viral. And it's pretty simple. It says, you know, basically the overarching principle is you shouldn't profit from the position of Congress. It, we shouldn't have PAC money or lobbyist money. Members of Congress shouldn't be allowed to go become lobbyists. You can't serve on the Armed Services Committee and then go work for Raytheon. You shouldn't have members of Congress trading stock. You shouldn't have uh, unlimited tenure for Supreme Court justices, have term limits, have term limits for members of Congress, and have a code of ethics for the Supreme Court. And it turns out that uh, you know Matt Gates and Nancy Mace and all these rep Republicans, in addition to progressives like Ilhan Omar and, uh, and Democrats like Dean Phillips, liked it. And Gates comes and says, well, if I can get three of Kana's reforms, uh, I will support a change in rules so that a few of us can't topple the speaker. So you can't have a motion to vacate. So basically, this reform plan is popular with everyone outside of Congress. And yet you can't get more than 20 members of Congress to sign up for, for this, uh, even signing up for three or four of the provisions. I mean, obviously, someone may have a philosophical disagreement with term limits. But the other things are pretty non-controversial and you still can't get members of Congress to sign up for it. So this, this was a forcing function. The one more point I wanna make, David, is that the anger at Washington is not just change the speaker. And in some sense, it's not just even change the party, though that would make a big difference. It's change the corruption, the sense of people not having a voice. And that's what they're, what's really resonating with the reform proposal at this time. The do you think the Republicans who talk uh, about some of these corruption issues, I mean, Gates, I was talking about not taking money from corporate PACs. Is this uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, I mean, it's hard to know if it's rhetoric or not, but, you know, real uh, the realignment. Right. Is, is the Republican Party or I should say a faction of the Republican Party? Is there a faction of the Republican Party that is somewhat realigning where people like you uh, in pushing, for instance, an anti-corruption plan can find genuine allies. And I, I want to add some history to this. I asked that having worked in Congress for in the House for Bernie Sanders. Uh, now, God, I'm going to date myself almost 25 years ago, where he did a lot of work with far right Republicans or sort of principled conservative Republicans, uh, Ron Paul and the like um, on specific issues. And I feel like that's kind of a lost, not like a lost art or something that's lost. So what I'm wondering is whether you think there is a possibility for some left right coalitions around some of these issues where the Republican, some of the Republican rhetoric seems a little bit realignment ish. Yes, I do. I mean, I, I think there is a recognition among some of the newer members of Congress that the working class, middle class has gotten shafted in this country, that Washington and the economy hasn't been working for them, that part of the reason is the influence of big money. Part of the reason is the influence of lobbyists. Part of the reason is the gerontocracy where people come to this town and stay for 30 years. And there's a desire to have change because people have seen the American dream slip away. It's not like we've had a remarkable moment of uh, American prosperity for everyone. And you have both that recognition among people on the right and the left. It's, I would say, an anti-status quo uh, sense. Now, the left has a much more programmatic agenda. Let's have Medicare for all. Let's have free public college. Let's have industrial policy to create new industry. But the right, at the very least, shares a view 
uh, in certain places to get the big money out, to get the lobbyists out, to return Washington to the people. And uh, that reform coalition needs to be bipartisan to have a real chance of success in, in, in getting through the House and the Senate. And uh, you see, I think, more and more people uh, joining some of these causes. Um, what chance do you think there is that some piece of your anti-corruption proposal will actually be legislated and happen? I mean, let's let's like really level with us here. I mean, yeah. it's a it's a good plan. Like, do you, do you think there's like a legit shot that even one piece of this is going to get through? This this time this time. So the the banning the pack banning banning pack and lobbyist money very very hard. Uh, you know that's the lifeblood of American politics, and I think that that's a a, a, a long shot. Uh, getting banning members of Congress to become lobbyists that seems to me low hanging fruit. That we should be able to get done. Uh, banning members of Congress from trading stock where there are a number of these bills they allow for diversified trusts and uh, uh, other things. Uh, we should be able to get that done. Uh, you know, so those are two uh, places that we can get done. Term limits harder, term limits for Supreme Court justices harder, Supreme Court judicial ethics harder to be bipartisan. But I, I guess the places where I would say in this Congress that we should be able to do something is on the banning members from becoming lobbyists, banning the stock trading in some form. And you've got a couple of bills, Abigail Spanberger's bill, uh, you've got Gates and AOC have a bill. Uh, you've had a number of these efforts. Uh, but, you know, you look at who's co-sponsoring them and you don't have more than 15 percent of the Congress on a lot of these things. And that is uh, is frustrating. The the Supreme Court question. Um, I want to dig down to this a little bit. Um, see, the, you've seen the, the Democrats push uh, for a code of ethics at the Supreme Court. But you have seen also uh, the Democrats not really as a sort of party platform writ large uh, be for things like expanding the court. You also haven't seen the Democrats, um, at least in the past Congresses when they controlled both houses, put in anti-judicial review provisions, um, although there was one I should mention in the in the Medicare uh, negotiation uh, 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 provision, which is good. Anti-judicial review, meaning saying to the Supreme Court, you cannot overturn this. And I think there's been a question among among some who, who say, OK, the Democrats rhetoric on how bad the Supreme Court is, is good. But the party has not fully taken seriously a real effort to challenge uh, uh, the power of the Supreme Court out of respect for norms. I guess my question is, what's your response to that? Is there some hesitation to, among lawmakers of your party to really do what's necessary to have a real fight with the Supreme Court? A fight that, for instance, uh, Franklin Roosevelt had, uh, in, 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 in my view, in, 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 a, in a story that's been uh, poorly or, or mis, mischaracterized in history. But that's a separate issue. But the point is that FDR had a huge fight with the Supreme Court, a real fight. And it, it doesn't yet seem like the leaders of the of the Democratic Party are willing to yet, if at all, have that real fight. What's your response to that? Well, FDR's fight on the court didn't go so well for FDR. I mean, I, he got the court to, to 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 shift, but it was probably the only thing that FDR did that wasn't popular that he that he did. But uh, and that's probably one of the 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 things that makes uh, people somewhat uh, more reluctant. But I. Uh, I agree with you on the judicial review. Uh, I, I mean, I think that we should be restricting judicial review. Roberts has said that that is a power that the Congress has. The president's own commission has said the term limits for Supreme Court justices is constitutional. The Supreme Court justices could then go serve as judges on a circuit court. Uh, they don't have to be on the Supreme Court. I guess my view is that that is so popular. When you look at the polling, it's 70, 80 percent. Uh, expanding the court is 40, 45 percent. I mean, it's much more uh, dubious, not saying, you know, it shouldn't be on the table. I said everything should be on the table. But the Supreme Court term limits is something that the president could run on in 24, win independence and actually have a better chance of getting done through a, a Senate uh, and, and House. And so that's where my focus has been.
Um, some people have, have asked, uh, are you running for president? And is what you're doing just prep for your potential 2028 <laughs> presidential race? So I'll leave it to you to well, answer that, that, that question. That, 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 I, I, here's what I say to him. I'm, I, I'm not. I was focused on supporting President Biden. And, and if he were to not run, I actually think Bernie Sanders would still be a wonderful candidate and would get fully behind him in, 20, uh, in, in 2024. Uh, but you know what I, I say to people with that, that there should be nothing wrong with ambition in a politician. I don't apologize for ambition if as long as the ambition is for the public good. And the question is really, in my view, not... Uh, is some pro person uh, ambitious or not ambitious? It's what are the policies that they're advocating? And for me, those policies are tackling the massive income inequality divide uh, by ensuring that we're actually redeveloping the country, bringing, why can't we bring new steel plants here that have less carbon footprints? Why can't we have new technology jobs across the country? Why can't we reindustrialize? Why can't we have the trade deficit with China go to zero? and making sure that we're taxing the wealth in my district, $10 trillion in Silicon Valley, to provide healthcare for everyone, Medicare for all, free public college, uh, to provide uh, universal childcare, and that we're having the political reforms. So if I can be out there uh, advocating what I believe the Democratic Party should be about, what I believe the country should be about, uh, then uh, that's a contribution to the country. And I, I'm not claiming to be Gandhi, I mean, no one, uh, in politics that I know doesn't have ambition. But the question is, is it ambition with a public purpose? All right, I want to go to some questions that folks uh, either emailed us uh, when the, when uh, we announced this event or uh, posted in the Q&A. Uh, here's the first one. Um, this is a question about um, India, the country of India. Uh, this summer, uh, you helped secure Indian Prime Minister Modi, his first official state visit in 2019, you publicly rejected Modi's brand of pro-caste Hindu nationalism, which has led to the systemic persecution of religious minorities in India, in particular Muslims and Christians. At the same time, you refused to publicly support a recent California bill that would have banned caste discrimination statewide. It was just vetoed by Governor Newsom. The Nation reported that you've received more than $100,000 from individuals with ties to Modi or Hindu national groups over the past dozen years. In response to criticisms around all this, are you willing to stop accepting money from Hindu nationalist leaders or, or make a firm statement about Newsom's vetoing of the caste discrimination bill? Well, I'm one of the few Hindu American politicians who's actually condemned uh, Hindu nationalism. I've condemned it publicly, and people can just go and look at my statements. My grandfather, as some people know, spent four years in jail uh, with Gandhi in, in India. And I just was in India. I met with Gandhi's great grandson, uh, who publicly tweeted out about how much he respected my support for pluralism. And I met with Muslims in Haryana and spoke out against the bulldozing of Muslim homes. And I spoke out against some of what was happening in Manipur while meeting with the prime minister, Prime Minister Modi and Prime and Foreign Minister Jay Shankar, because we need an alliance with India, uh, which is the, it, it critical for our strategic interests and a uh, the, the largest uh, population-wise democracy, but doing so on liberal pluralistic values. Now, I have uh, support from thousands of people around the, the, the country, uh, and uh, some of them are of Indian origin. I don't ask them uh, when they go online, uh, who they're supporting uh, overseas, just like you wouldn't ask someone who was Italian American who they were supporting in, uh, in terms of their views on Italy or Jewish American in terms of their views on Israel. Uh, but I certainly don't in any way show up to any uh, any event that has anything to do with Hindu nationalism. And so, no, I'm not going to give back money because someone may have said something uh, supporting a, a, a particular ideology in India. That's uh, uh, their right. Uh, but what I care about is my own stance, which has been clear for pluralism. So, so just as a follow, I mean, if if Modi is is uh, represents Hindu nationalism, and there is a huge Muslim population in India, where does this all uh, go? Uh, does it does it I mean, does it potentially go the way of 
Israel and Palestine, where there is just an ongoing uh, uh, conflict uh, here. I mean, if it's a I mean, it's not, you know, it's not it's not going to be a Hindu only nation, but but where where do you think this can go under Modi's politics? Uh, where do you think it should go? What should be done, for instance, among in U.S. policy to try to get to an outcome that does respect pluralism? Well, I think we have to talk about human rights and pluralism in our bilateral conversations, recognizing our own imperfections as a democracy, of course. Uh, you know, we're we're the country that just four years ago had a Muslim ban uh, and we're a country that had a, a president not respecting the rights of a peaceful transfer of power. So for America to start preaching about some of this stuff uh, is, is not as effective if we aren't looking at our, our own uh, challenges with democracy. But of course, we should be prioritizing that in the relationship uh, with India. I, I will say, I think uh, there are definitely challenges in India where the suppression of uh, political speech, uh, the, the the challenges with uh, the persecution of certain people in the press. Uh, but, you know, when I was there at, at, at one of the hotels, you had uh, a scene where uh, all of these people were there in, uh, in traditional uh, Arab dress and uh, mingling with Hindu Americans, uh, I mean, Hindus. And, you know, India has had religions coexisting for hundreds of years. So I don't believe that uh, that Modi will succeed in erasing not just the Gandhi Nehru heritage of the country, uh, but also the generations of coexistence that were there. But we should be vigilant. Hey, this is a question from subscriber uh, John who asks to go back to the uh, anti-corruption bill you, you're, you've been pushing. What blowback has Representative Khanna faced from other members of Congress, if any, regarding his proposal? What support has he seen beyond independent media and the few members who have, who have supported it? What sign has there been of pressure being effective on other members when it comes to uh, an anti-corruption plan? You know, in Washington, blowback is rarely loud. It's usually silent. <laughs> uh, no member of Congress is going to come up to me and say, hey, Ro, that's a really terrible idea. You're proposing all these things that have 80 percent approval uh, <laughs> or, uh, or or stand up in the caucus and say that they just won't get on it. They just won't support it. They just won't move it. They may just have a private conversation with leadership saying, don't bring this for a vote on the House floor. We don't want to have a vote against it. Uh, or and we don't want to be forced into voting for it. So what kills things in Washington is, is the silence, is people doing things uh, not uh, transparently. And what we need is far more people to co-sponsor it, far more people to be like Ilhan Omar or Dean Phillips or Matt Gates or uh, or Nancy Mace and say, yeah, we're going to back these reforms. Uh, Eighty percent of the American people want these reforms, even if you philosophically are not 100 percent convinced, why not just do things that are going to improve the credibility and integrity of an institution that's in such disrespute? Uh, here's a question from uh, subscriber Patrick um, about the uh, Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, did Netanyahu aid and strengthen Hamas to defeat uh, this effectively Abbas and the PLO? Did West Bank settler violence raise risks of Hamas attacks? And as Shin Beit warned Netanyahu in June of 2023, and, and I guess here's the question, why has there been no American government pressure, real pressure to stop the settlements in the West Bank? Well, I'm for stopping the, the new settlements. I mean, that's been my policy uh, and uh, I have articulated it. Uh, I believe that the American government should articulate it uh, very clearly. Uh, but I don't, and I, look, I'm no, no fan of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I've been critical, but I don't blame him uh, for Hamas's outrageous uh, attacks. I mean, that would be uh, akin to, blaming George W. Bush for the attacks of 9-11. I mean, we can afterwards look at how we can strengthen uh, our intelligence and Israeli intelligence, but there's only one person to blame for these attacks, and those are uh, Hamas. And there's uh, there are ways to uh, engage in, uh, in, in registering 
uh, uh, protest and, 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 and discontent, and those aren't easy, but uh, King and Gandhi and, and Mandela have shown us what those ways are. Uh, and there are uh, then just acts of terrorism. And when there are acts of terrorism, uh, you're going to get the world's strong and justified condemnation. This is from Margarita. Uh, uh, Representative Khanna, why are you not calling for a ceasefire instead of emphasizing support for Israel? What has been your experience with lobbyists like J Street and APAC? Can you describe what it would be like if we banned lobbyists like this from Congress and if your anti-corruption bills had a chance to pass? Well, my bill does uh, call for banning all lobbyist money and banning PAC money, and it calls for not having members of Congress go become lobbyists, and you could probably extend that to senior staff as well. I'm just starting with uh, members of Congress. Well, J Street, in some sense, was a counterweight to, to, to APAC in creating right. space for people to be more uh, critical of Israeli policy. Uh, but I... Uh, I, I don't think that the support in Congress today for Israel on this issue of standing with them against the Hamas attacks has to do with APEC or J Street. Candidly, I just think people saw the images of babies being beheaded and uh, saw those attacks and are in deep sympathy with the Israeli people. We can talk about the broader issues of settlements and the blockade and uh, issues that need to take place for a two state solution. Uh, but uh, the, the the sentiment of uh, of of Congress today is is genuine, and, and many of us knew people who had stayed in the homes of uh, Israelis in those towns when they had visited. Knew some who had been who were taken hostage or killed. Uh, so there is a cultural tie with Israel that the United States has that cannot be discounted. This is from uh, uh, subscriber TM. Is India really a democracy if its repression of Muslims is increasing? Modi and his party are deeply racist Hindu supremacists, and you have changed your previous human rights position with your new alignment with the military industrial com complex and forces that are pushing for war with China. Your response? Well, I'm the only person in the entire Armed Services Committee who voted against the defense budget. So uh, it, it, uh, I'm consistently the only person who does that. Uh, so I, I certainly uh, don't think that uh, anyone could could accuse me of uh, being too sympathetic to defense. Usually I get attacked the, the other way. I mean, and I've consistently said that we shouldn't have a defense budget approaching a trillion dollars, that we should go after defense contractors. Now, I've said that we need to make sure that we have uh, sufficient naval superiority and the South China Sea and Taiwan Straits to deter a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, but that's to prevent war, not to uh, to provoke it. And I believe that we need a relationship with India, but that doesn't mean that uh, we can't condemn uh, Hindu nationalism. Uh, and India is a democracy. I mean, it's not a perfect democracy by any means, but uh, no democracy is perfect. I mean, we look at the issue of voting rights in this country, look at the issue of uh, the denial of uh, immigration to Muslims last the, the Congress. Look at the inhumane treatment. I mean, the last administration, inhumane treatment of uh, the, the under Trump of so many uh, human rights. So I, I I don't think that you can dismiss the complexity of Indian democracy because of the leader that currently is is there. This is from uh, Joseph about the Supreme Court. Congressional power over Supreme Court jurisdiction, does it represent a leverage point a, along the lines of simply stripping jurisdiction until they accept ethics? This is basically uh, the question of whether you can really limit the kinds of cases or or I guess I guess, you know, I would broaden it out a little bit, if, if I may, Joseph, in, into a question of there's limiting jurisdictions. Like what else can be done to get the Supreme Court in a game of chicken or a game of chess to, at minimum, accept uh, a new ethics code? Well, one is just calling them out. I mean, the rhetoric against the court has been uh, tame. Look, this is where I would look at what Lincoln or FDR did and go after a court that's totally out of touch with modern day facts. I mean, they're taking away women's fundamental freedoms. They're taking away uh, our rights to safety from gun violence. They are uh, engaged in 
decisions that are gunning working families and labor unions. Uh, and they are uh, on their own admission, uh, having billionaire friends finance their their livelihoods in, in the case of, of a couple of the justices. So we need uh, the president, the congressional leadership calling this out and taking that case to the American people. I still think that they care about uh, their public opinion, the, the way they're perceived. And that pressure uh, it can uh, make it so that uh, uh, they are shamed into adopting uh, a code of ethics. But you know, the framers never thought the Supreme Court would be powerful because they didn't have the money and they didn't have the military. Uh, and so I think it's just we in Congress and the and the executive branch have deferred too much to, to the Supreme Court, probably because of the legacy and, and fondness of the Warren Court. But this is no longer the Warren Court. I want to turn to uh, some a couple of political questions about the uh, the election. Um, this has come up. This is kind of a summary of questions that have been sent in. Um, you're supporting President Biden for reelection. Uh uh, uh, sort of overarching question about the Democratic Party has come up, which is which is the question of, in the face of Biden's poll numbers, specifically on the economy, generally on job approval, the question has been raised: Why does there not seem to be as uh, competitive and vociferous a primary contest uh, for the nomination that perhaps would have? happened in the past. I mean, I think back to 1968, uh, Eugene McCarthy, and, which ultimately knocked LBJ uh, out of running for re-election, which created the space for RFK. Uh, of course, RFK was assassinated uh, and the uh, vice president, uh, Hubert Humphrey, lost that race. Uh, 1980, there was a primary by Ted Kennedy of Jimmy Carter. Why is there? does there not seem to be any single national elected official in the Democratic Party willing to run in a primary against Joe Biden, considering the poll numbers that we see? Well, first of all, the Johnson case, I don't think is analogous because Johnson got us into Vietnam and uh, it had uh, Biden gotten us into a, the Iraq war or something, you would have seen a primary challenge. But Johnson was very unique. Now, the Carter case is more analogous, where Carter uh, failed to deliver on single pair, actually. People forget this. He ran on single pair and he didn't deliver on it. Ted Kennedy was uh, upset enough, or at least used that as reason enough to challenge him. But what does Ted Kennedy have that uh, most of the people being uh, bandied about don't have? He was a universal name, which is to say that the only people possibly who could have taken on this president were Bernie Sanders or possibly Elizabeth Warren, but likely Bernie Sanders. You are not going to have some upstart or some person sitting there at 5 10% name ID, uh, whether it's a Shapiro, Whitmer, Newsom, or someone else, uh, go challenge Joe Biden. It's just not going to happen. You would need a brand name person who already has an infrastructure nationally to make that decision. And I think the reason they decided not to is they saw Trump on the other side and they didn't want to be part of hurting uh, the president's chances. But the to, to beat an incumbent president, uh, you have to have a pretty big national name ID. You can't be a Bill Clinton or a Jimmy Carter coming out of nowhere. How concerned are you about Biden's uh, political standing in terms of his ability to defeat the likely nominee, Donald Trump? I think it's going to be a hard fought race. I think it's going to be a hard fought race because people are still anxious about their life. You know, interest rates are high, gas prices are high, food prices are high, housing is hard to get, wages are going up, but they haven't gone up as fast. Yeah, we can talk about all the jobs that have been created, lowest unemployment rate, but people feel anxious about their life. And until uh, they have that, we can't run on a triumphalist message. We have to run on uh, a message of a choice election, uh, that we've taken these steps uh, that are in the interest of the working class. We gave checks to uh, to family stimulus checks. We did the child tax credit that put money into the pockets of families. Give us uh, another uh, four years and we're going to get something done on medical debt. We're going to get something done on child care. We're going to get something done on finally raising the, 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 the minimum wage. But I, I don't think we can just tell the story of, hey, things are great. And 
uh, and, and it's going to be a hard fought race. The, the the question of of people's views on Bidenomics, um, and I don't really like that term. I don't. It's not really clear what that term actually means. But you know, I I, I think that uh, look the, the way I see what's gone on in the Biden world is that his poll his poll numbers were pretty good uh, when he was pushing the American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan. Uh, granted, it was early in his term, so I guess the the you know the sort of honeymoon period. But it was a, a moment in which the U.S. government actually cut a big check to people who needed help. It was not top down economics; it was actually for the middle and working class of this country. It was the first time in my lifetime, frankly, I can remember uh, such a big bill. It was it was actually probably the most, if not one of the most important uh, pieces of legislation in my lifetime, and it correlated with Biden's polls doing so well. Now his polls on the economy are not doing so well in conjunction with the uh, aid that came with the American Rescue Plan being cut off. I guess the question out of all of this is, what is the lesson from that? And what do you make of the kind of pundit class insinuating that Americans are um, uninformed and insufficiently grateful to Joe Biden uh, on economic issues. I mean, is that really a good message heading into the 2024 election? Like, instead of saying, you know, I, Bill Clinton's, I feel your pain. It's like, you know, you, you should be more grateful to us. Like, what do you make of all that? I don't get it. I I, I don't get it, especially from a pundit class that has such a value uh, on, on the private sector. Imagine uh, the Apple uh, CEO and executive team sitting around a conference room saying, you know what, those consumers are so dumb. They don't really understand how good the iPhone is. You know, we really need to tell them how, how many features the iPhone has and, uh, and and explain to them why they aren't getting it. I mean, no one says that. In the business, the first thing is the customer is always right. And the first thing should be that the voter is right. I mean, the vote you can't lecture voters on how they feel. And well, let me let me stop you there and and and, and just just interrupt for a second and, and ask, do you think it's people being uh misled about the economy like you you know you're you're watching too much fox news it's a shorthand of it or do you, or do you think it really is an expression of people's lived material conditions that they're frustrated with i think people have been frustrated in this country for the last 40 years seeing the working class and middle class be hollowed out and inflation just was a acute reminder of how bad things have been and how the american dream has slipped away how they can't afford a house uh and uh afford to support their family and how their kids are probably not going to have the same life that they did. And they're angry. They're angry that that is their condition. And then they see the gas prices and food prices, and it reminds them of uh, how much the uh, American dream has slipped away from their parents' generation to what their kids are going to have. And someone has to speak to that. And what President Biden can say is he's trying to reverse that decline. But that decline was over four decades. He can't reverse it in four years. And that these are the steps he has taken with the American Rescue Plan with the child tax rate. These are the steps he will take over the next four years. And these are the steps the Democratic Party is going to take over the next 20 years to give the American people and the working class and middle class a shot again at the American dream. But I I, I don't think you can sell uh, mourning in America at a time where the working class and the middle class has really been hollowed out and you have massive income inequality. I, I couldn't agree more with what with what you just said, which is it, that's what's been so confusing to me is that uh, a real a presidential reelection race an incumbent running for reelection is inherently an, a, a referendum on the incumbent. So the incumbent has to be campaigning, uh, channeling, honoring and respecting the dissatisfaction rather than just bragging about how good everything is. And I I'm not sure why that hasn't seemed to click with the Biden political team, uh, but you're right. I mean, you put it perfectly. Uh, Morning in America is not a resonant message uh, right now. Uh, and and, I, and I guess I guess a follow up to that is, have you said that to the White House and what has been their response? I mean, what do you make of their uh, they seem a bit tone deaf. Well, I have said that. I mean, you know, Bernie Sanders, obviously I'm biased because I was a co-chair of his campaign, but he gave this great speech I recommended to folks at St. Anselm, uh, New Hampshire recently, where he talked about FDR's 1936 re-election campaign. And I actually think FDR's 36 campaign is a good example. FDR bragged about a lot of the New Deal, but he said, 
things were really bad still for a lot of Americans and he was not going to rest and the economic royalists had too much power. And here's what he was going to do in his second term, because unemployment may have come down from 25 percent to 18 percent, but it was still way too high. And here's what he was going to do uh, to continue and deepen the work of the New Deal. And the guy got four terms. It was probably the most popular politician in American life. So it seems to me that the 36 campaign of FDRs is a better model for the time, the anxiety that we have now, even though unemployment is low, uh, than uh, a, a campaign of 96 in the Clinton era or 84 in the Reagan era. Look, I was I was grew up in Buck County, Pennsylvania in the 90s. I was middle class, not not working class, not wealthy. But in the 90s, there was the sense, at least at the time, that things were uh, prosperous people still hadn't felt the devastation of NAFTA. It hadn't hit the the the, the, the desolation of uh, of, of uh, Middle America, and so it was. There was just a different feeling in the country. You talk to people now, and uh, even people in my district, one of the most affluent districts, and there's an anxiety about the country. In fact, this morning I had someone in my uh, office who's just graduating in electrical engineering and said he can't get a job. And I said, really? It's at 3.5% unemployment. He said, yeah, businesses are cutting back. So I, I don't think the lived experience with people right now uh, is uh, one of great enthusiasm about the economy. Okay, we're going to do two more questions from the audience, then we're going to uh, let uh, Congressman Connor go. This one's from Emily. Uh, it's a question about why has there been so little mention of Trump's epic failures, such as his catastrophic response to covid can anyone imagine having him as president again? I want to broaden that out too and ask, what is what do you make of Trump's, uh, not just his popularity in the Republican primary, but his strength in the polls based, uh, knowing what we went through under his leadership, knowing, uh, I mean, all of the corruption scandals, like where do you think that strength in the general election polls comes from? No, it scares the hell out of me because his second term is going to be uh, uh, punitive and 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 filled with retribution, and he's going to have a better sense of how Washington works, and he'll be able to do more more harm. But I I take the 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 essence of his movement as one of anger against a uh, against the institutions of Washington failing people, and it's an anger at a in America that is. Uh, slipping away uh, in the American dream. I'm not saying that economic solves everything or bringing people economic opportunity solves everything. Of course, there are complex issues of race and demog uh, uh, demography and, uh, and identity. But at the core of Trumpism is this view that the jobs were hollowed out, the uh, Washington's not working for them, and let's just blow the system up. There was no affirmative vision after that. Where are the new steel plants under Donald Trump? Where are the new aluminum plants? Where is the new industry? There was none. But that anger is still there. And uh, and it gets back to the earlier point. We Democrats are, are, are great at the programmatic stuff, but until you acknowledge people's anger first, you're not going to get them to get to hear uh, the other part. And I, I do think the only thing that Trump does that some of the right does at these points is channel people's grievance. And uh, what we've got to do is channel people's anger and then transform that into an aspirational vision uh, for the country. Final question. This is from Sharon, and, and I'm, I'm glad we're we're touching on uh, climate here. Uh, it's a question about climate. Congressman Connor, you're on the Armed Services Committee. So is my congressman who's been in office for over 20 years and is very pro-military. We need to cut carbon dioxide emissions, and that should include the U.S. military. What are your thoughts on developing uh, just transition programs to create good new jobs appropriate for the 21st century? Just transition programs could get us off fossil fuels, but we also need to cut uh, U.S. military activities because its carbon dioxide emissions aren't calculated into international agreements to cut CO2 emissions. So i am just open it up to you to answer that question. Well, first of all, what we need to do is stop approving new fossil fuel infrastructure like the Amen. Willow Project, like these terminals for exporting more oil or the CP2 terminal to export natural gas. I mean, the president made a pledge, no new permitting for no new fossil uh, for new fossil fuel infrastructure on public lands. And he needs to keep that pledge. 
I agree with you that the military needs to have targets to reduce CO2 emission. They do have those targets, the Navy, the Army, and the uh, and, and the Air Force, but they're probably uh, too modest. I think they're at 25% reduction. I would be supportive of increasing those targets uh, to make sure that the uh, military is leading in reducing CO2 emissions, and that may mean uh, reducing the, uh, the, the, the their broad uh, broad footprint, or it could mean uh, investing in types of renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency equipment. I want to thank uh, Congressman Rokana for taking time tonight. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I want to thank all of our subscribers for subscribing to The Lever. Uh, uh, if you want to pitch in an extra bit on our tip jar, go to uh, levernews.com, hit tip jar. It helps us do these events. And I think this is a this is a good summary from one of our subscribers, uh, Joseph, who said this. And I want, I want, Ro, I want you to hear this. He said, uh, Congressman Connor, greetings from Philly. Hopefully the, the Phils are winning. I haven't checked the score lately. By the <laughs> way, I'm, I'm originally from the Philly area. Rokana is originally from the Philly area. I am. Joseph is from the Philly area. Go Phillies. Uh, Vaughn and, Hayes and, what, and Mike Schmidt teams. Yeah, ex, when ex, I was yeah the, the, those weren't the greatest days. Lenny the, the, Dykstra. The, the, those were the good days. days. <laughs> those were the good days. But what Joseph says is, um, I want to thank you for being courageous enough to face these questions. If only leaders had to sit for prime minister's questions as they do in the UK, uh, though clearly that's not the solution to all the problems, uh, given the state of uh, British politics. Please keep talking to us and better yet, encourage your fellow Congress people to do this more often. And so I want to thank everybody uh, for that. For for I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank you for being willing to take tough questions. You're one of the people one of the few people in Congress who's willing to come back and answer tough questions. And that is a rare thing. And we should honor it, whether people agree with your specific answers or not. Thank you for that. And stay in touch. Thank you, David. I appreciate what you do and always look forward to coming back on. Thanks again. And thanks to everybody. Have a great night.